All right, you're live. Good morning, I'm Vice Mayor Shanika Smith and Chair of the Public Safety Committee. I would like to welcome you to our January 25th meeting. All council members and staff are participating virtually. To help our audience follow along, I'll state each section of the agenda aloud. We are streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link on the front page of the city website. We also have an option, have the option for the public to listen live by phone by dialing 855-925-2801 and entering the code 9477. For today's meeting, we have the option for people to call in and comment live during the meeting. To call in and comment live, use the same number, 855-925-2801, meeting code 9477. Your phone will be muted and you'll hear the meeting live. At this point, callers will, will hear. For more options, press star three. Pressing star three will allow callers to continue to listen live and join the speaker queue. As stated on the agenda, public comment will now be heard at the beginning and the end of the public safety meeting. Callers may comment only once during these general public comment sessions, either during the beginning or end of public comment period, not both. Callers will have three minutes each. We will um, be taking public comment after council and staff introduction. So if you would like to make a comment, please join the speaker queue now by pressing star three. If you're watching the meeting through the live stream while you're listening to the meeting by phone, please be sure to turn down the volume on your device before speaking. I'll now go through and introduce all the committee members and staff who are participating virtually. Just give us a quick hello. Councilwoman Kilgore. Good morning. Councilwoman Roney. Hello. City Manager Deborah Campbell. Good morning. City Attorney Brad Branham. Good morning. Fire Chief Scott Burnett. Good morning. Police Chief David Zach. Good morning. Director of Transportation Ken Putnam. Yes. Good morning. Fire Marshal Kelly Hens. Kelly, are you with us? I was on mute. Good morning. Good morning to you. Um, Senior Deputy Fire Marshal Bill States. Good morning. Captain Mike Lamb. Captain Lamb couldn't be with us today. Okay. So, and we also have a special guest, Jenna Toon from F Epic Recruitment Solutions. She'll be able to answer questions when we get to the section on our recruitment efforts. Good morning. Good morning. We'll now start the agenda with public comment. Are there any callers in the speaker queue? Uh, yes, um, we have two callers and I'll let you know um, if any more join in. Okay. Caller ending in 6029, your line is open. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. This is Patrick Conan from East West Asheville. First, I want to point out that APD achieved a milestone last week. They posted their presentation for this meeting along with the rest of the agenda. Now that we've seen it can be done, I encourage this committee to require the same advanced publication of documents for all future meetings. Regarding APD's presentation, I call the committee's attention to a few points. First, I want to point out what is missing. At the last council meeting, APD presented questionable data and significant policy changes. That information was never brought to this committee, and it appears there's no plan to do so in the future. I encourage this committee to do its job and provide oversight and opportunities for public input on these significant policy changes. The presentation does, however, contain six slides justifying actions in Aston Park. I encourage this committee to ask necessary questions. For example, public records indicate that APD's seven-day notice for camps was still in effect in December 2021. How can APD's actions be within policy if that's the case? The disconnect between publicly available policies and what officers on the ground are saying is concerning. 
Regarding the arrest of journalists, this committee must again ask questions. What steps did APD take to allow the press to do their job? Is it standard practice for APD to hold the phone of anyone arrested for second-degree trespass for weeks, or do they only do that to journalists? It is the job of this committee to protect the rights of residents and the press in our city. You need to speak up. Finally, I want to comment on the proposed food distribution ordinance. Such ordinances are morally wrong and will open the city up to legal challenges. However, what concerns me the most is the lack of transparency and process by our council. The city's press release states, this idea is in the exploratory stage and has not been presented to council for policy consideration. Yet public records clearly indicate the council was in fact presented with a policy proposal at your check-ins last week. And the details of that policy proposal further contradict the city's press release. As members of council, you know that the city's press release was inaccurate, yet I haven't heard any of you speak up and clarify the facts for the public. Your silence is deafening. To the members of this committee, it's time to shift course. Do the right thing and tell the truth. You are considering a wildly unpopular ordinance that betrays the values many in our city hold. This effort was never mentioned in a public meeting, yet council was receiving reports from staff. It appears that this work was happening behind closed doors intentionally. Thankfully, these misguided efforts have been brought to the light, but this is not a good way to work. We could avoid so much misinformation if council would start doing the public's work in the sunshine. Thank you. Caller ending in 0852, your line is open. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yes, my name is Jensen Gelfond. I live in West Asheville, and I'm calling in to give feedback about how the city uh, has been uh, interacting with our uh, unhoused population. Uh, I'm also concerned about uh, the new offering of putting additional red tape around people being able to be fed and um, for basic uh, you know, human decency for folks to help each other, now having to wade through potentially uh, a new bureaucratic process. Uh, any new bureaucratic processes that are initiated around our unhoused population are inevitably uh, going to um, reduce the amount of aid that can be given to folks. And um, with the amazing way that our, our town is booming, uh, the least we can do is to give more resources to our unhoused population and, and not fewer. Uh, I think it's also important that we follow the CDC guidelines around uh, the dispersal of camps. Uh, we are still in the middle of COVID. We are also in the middle of winter. And I did not see any uh, information in the new APD policy around how things might be treated differently in the winter time. There are basic human necessities that are harder to meet for our unhoused populations in these colder months, not to mention COVID. And um, I think that should be taken strongly into consideration when deciding about uh, dispersing or not dispersing these camps. Uh, ooh, I think we need to really understand this issue better about what is actually accomplished when camps are dispersed. How is that supposed to help our community? Even those business owners or uh, people who are complaining about uh, trash and needles and other things, uh, what happens when a camp gets dispersed? Uh, are these people just supposed to leave Asheville or are they going to create a new camp uh, somewhere else, only now they have even fewer resources than ever. Uh, this is a conversation that needs to be had, frankly, between our citizens and our government. And uh, we need to do the right thing, not only morally, but the thing that will actually push things in the right direction in terms of getting people um, out of uh, being unhoused. Uh, so I look forward to finding a way to contribute uh, further. And thank you. That was our last caller in the queue. Okay, thank you. 
Um, moving on to the next item on our agenda, um, is there um, a second to approve the minutes? Can I get a motion to a second? Okay, I'll do a roll this call vote. Got it. Um, Councilwoman Kilgore? Aye. Councilwoman Roney? Aye. And myself, aye. Minutes have been approved. Um, before we go any further, I think we have another um, new addition to our, our city team. Um, I failed to introduce Rachel Wood. She's a new assistant city manager. I think this is her first committee meeting. She might, she may be assigned to this committee. So welcome to you, Rachel. Welcome to our Thank team. you. Good morning. Good morning to you. All right. Um, our next item is a franchise agreement for petty cab service. Ken, Ken Putnam will present this item. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Smith and council members. Um, we'll give it a second for it to load. Next slide, please, Jenna. Thank you. This, uh, this is a franchise agreement by, it's gonna be named Blue Ridge Rickshaw, and they want to provide a pedal bicycle taxi service in um, Asheville. And this is classified as a slow moving vehicle operation, which could have a minor impact on vehicular traffic flow. So in the past, we've brought these requests to the Public Safety Committee for review and input. Next slide, please. Uh, this operation wants to operate within the city of Asheville. Uh, the commercial service areas would include the Central Business District, the South Slope, Biltmore Village, and River Arts District. The residential service areas include the Burton Street, Hillcrest, Lee Walker Heights, Erskine, Walton, Livingston Heights communities, and there's a complete list in the franchise agreement itself. The service plans to operate seven days a week between 7 a.m. and th until 3 a.m. Next slide, please. It will be prohibited from operating on any public street where the speed limit is 35 miles per hour or higher. Uh, third party advertising on the outside of the vehicle is not allowed, and the applicant is aware of this requirement. Initially, there will be only one vehicle and one operator, uh, but we've structured the franchise agreement to allow growth, and he will provide basically point-to-point -point transportation service and also various tours. Next slide, please. And here is just a picture of a typical vehicle that he is in the process of looking at to purchase. And then the last slide, please. And so what staff is recommending is that the Public Safety Committee approve a motion recommending that this agreement to Blue Ridge Rickshaw to operate the service within Asheville be, be moved to City Council for review and approval. And if you do that, it goes to City Council on two different time frames, February 8th and February 22nd. I'll be glad to answer any questions. And the applicant himself is here if uh, you'd like to speak with that individual. Can we have a Yes, thank you. Um, so in the past, when we've seen a business um, seeking to use the public right of way for profit, um, these kinds of proposals have come through the Multimodal Transportation Commission. And as a liaison to that advisory board, I haven't seen this on an agenda. I'm not aware that it has. So could I receive clarity on it if it has already gone to or is intended to go to the Multimodal for recommendation? Uh, yes, that's a very good question, and uh, the timing kind of messed us up, but I'm on the agenda for tomorrow's Multimodal Transportation Commission for them to take it up. Right. So while I do appreciate that it is coming here, we do have the highest bike and pedestrian accident ratio in the state of North Carolina. Um, I also... Um, acknowledge that this is a non-vehicular mode. So I had a couple specific questions for this presentation. Um, when did this proposal begin that created the time scenario where we're going before multimodal? Actually, uh, with COVID and everything, this was first brought to our attention uh, probably about a year ago. Okay. Um, and what would be the impact of waiting to seek the multimodal review before public safety reviews? The only impact, and the applicant may be able to address that more, but he's in the process of trying to purchase a vehicle, and he's trying to structure everything that he can begin the service sometime in April when the weather breaks. 
So if we waited until multimodal tomorrow, we could see this on our February uh, public safety agenda. I just would like to know the impact of doing that. Maybe the applicant could speak to that. Uh, yes. Uh, hey, my name is Jordan Rubnick. Um, the only thing is just timing. Um, I was looking to get started um, spring, so April or May, um, and it just affects the amount of time for me to purchase the vehicle and get started. So, Thank you. I appreciate that. And so I think this really comes down to like the internal process and the expectation that at our advisory boards be able to navigate this before it comes to a council committee. Um, and then a very specific question that I have around this presentation is impeding the traffic flow. Um, so we know from multiple studies that traffic moving slower is safer for everyone using any mode of transportation. I'm prepared to recommend this to the full council. But as a process part, I do still have the same concerns and I think we could do better in the future. Brad, did you want to chime in? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chairman. I, I just want to add a little additional context to the points that Councilwoman Roney was making. From a process standpoint, it's important to note that uh, these particular agreements, which would be a franchise agreement in nature, uh, actually require two separate readings before the council. So in terms of planning this out, uh, we would have uh, two separate meetings. So we'll take approximately a full month of council before they can make a final determination. And I just want to make everyone aware of that from a timing perspective. So just as a process point, if public safety makes a recommendation today to send this forward to council, then we have the multimodal recommendation. And for some reason in a franchise agreement in the future, if an issue is brought forward, public safety, I would just ask that we address that again. Is there a motion on the floor? So motion. Moved. All right. I'll do a roll call vote for approval. Well, let me just state the motion. <laughs> I recommend that Public Safety Committee approve a motion recommending the, that the franchise agreement to Blue Ridge Rickshaw to operate a pedal bicycle taxi service with the city of Asheville be moved to full council for review and approval. And we have a second there. Um, do a roll call vote for approval. Councilwoman Kilgore? Yeah, aye. Councilwoman Roney? Aye. And myself, aye. And that motion carries. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we will make uh, improvements to our internal process. I can assure you of that. We appreciate that, Ken. Thank you. Um, up next, we have an update from the Asheville Fire Department on an, its fire investigation program. Chief Burnett is here and also um, Fire Marshal Kelly is here. Yeah, Chief Hines, if you want to go ahead. Thanks, Chief. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for having um, myself, Kelly Hines, as a Fire Marshal, as well as a Fire Department to speak. Uh, we've made great strides in continuous improvement in the public safety realm of the fire department, fire prevention, which is the fire marshal's office. And about two years ago, we went um, to a new restructure. If you can go to the next slide, please, Jenna. Thanks. Um, in that, um, the purpose of restructuring was to, to try to improve safety, increase resources, and um, better our outcomes in all areas of the fire marshal's office. It allows us to focus um, and train, specially trained personnel to um, operate within three separate um, divisions or areas within the fire marshal's office. We do periodic inspections. We do new construction plan review and um, inspections. Uh, we also have an area that involves fire investigations and public education. And that's the area I want to uh, focus on today is the fire investigations. Um, we now have a more team approach and we have achieved greater outcomes because of that. Next slide. Um, so let me tell you a bit about fire inspection, fire investigations. Uh, we, uh, by the state, the um, fire chief 
is tasked with making sure that all fires that occur within the jurisdiction are investigated. The purpose of that is simply to find what the cause and the origin of that fire um, was. Once we have that data, we can then try to prevent it or minimize the impact of the fire that occurred and uh, fires that may occur in the future. We can identify trends that happened over time. Um, and that's exactly, you know, at the point that we're just now receiving enough data in our collection to provide some better outcomes. We have also in that restructure teamed up with APD and along with that um, coordination, um, we have been able to increase the uh, closure of fire investigations that are of criminal nature because we ask the professionals um, that deal with crimes on a regular basis to help us in specializing in those crimes. And APD has uh, helped us achieve better outcomes in that area as well. So I'm going to um, let the supervisor or senior deputy fire marshal, Bill States, introduce him and let him share our outcomes and a little bit more data on how we achieve those outcomes. So thank you all. Bill. All right, good morning, everyone. So um, the Asheville Fire Department has a fire investigation program that is uh, very structured um, and very unique. We're one of a few fire departments in the state of North Carolina that has a fire investigator assigned to one of our shifts 24 seven, that's our FM 10 position. So we have a fire investigator that works our same shifts as our firefighters. So this gives us a real uh, advantage when it comes to determining an origin of cause of a fire, since we can get there uh, pretty quickly. Um, if you would go to the next slide, please. So this slide right here talks about the number of fires that we have investigated from our FM10 position. So you can see in 2016, we had about 73. Um, and then now, as of last year, we were at 109 fires that we have investigated. Um, this year, when I did this slide, we were at, uh, we had five fires so far for this year. And as of today, we're up to 11. If you will go to the next slide, please. So some of the outcomes from our program is, as, as I talked about in 2016, we had 73 fires. And out of those, we were able to determine the origin and cause 71.3% of the time. So when we say determine the, the cause, um, we have to do, we have to follow the scientific method as outlined in uh, NFPA 921, which is the guide for uh, fire and explosion investigations. And essentially, if we have two hypotheses we cannot uh, rule out, then we have to call the fire an undetermined fire. So we were able to determine the cause 71% of the time, which is, uh, Pretty, pretty good for uh, 2016. Uh, we had 14 incendiary fires, which incendiary fire is a fire that is uh, purposely set. Uh, so we had uh, five arrests and that was about a 35.7% clearance rate. Uh, we didn't have any, any records on what happened after the arrest was made. Um, that was due to uh, in 2016, we had a fire investigator that was hired through the fire department, but it was also a sworn officer. So they maintained all their own records and some of those records are, were still uh, held under lock and key um, due to the nature of uh, criminal investigations. So since this uh, reorganization, as of last year, we had 109 fires investigated and we were able to determine the origin and cause 84.5% of the time, which was uh, about a 13% increase. So that's uh, that's excellent work. Um, we had 12 incendiary fires as of last year. So we had one arrest and four individuals uh, were um, committed to uh, mental health programs. So that allows uh, for a 41.6% clearance rate. I put a, a note on here that uh, that's a 5.9% improvement from 2016 and it's 18% above the national average. So that's uh, that's great work um, using this uh, this model and being assisted by APD. 
Um, if you will go to the next slide, please. So out of all the fires that we have um, investigated, uh, here's the, the trends of what we're, we're seeing. So our, our largest cause of fires is cooking, which is in line with the national average, um, about 31%. And as you can see, um, we have 28% vehicle fires and it just kind of goes down from there. Um, so as of last year, we 5.9, just shy of 6% of all of our fires were, were uh, set fires. If you would go to the next slide, please. So how do we use these trends? So we uh, offer public uh, educational opportunities. So um, being the supervisor for our fire life safety educator, any information we gain from fire investigations, we turn over to them if they're able to uh, educate the public to prevent fires. So uh, if we have a fire in an apartment building due to unattended cooking, our educator can provide safety and training to those uh, to the apartment complexes really quickly so that it's still fresh on people's minds and they uh, can start um, keeping, uh, you know, just have better understanding of what the incident happened while it was still fresh on their mind. Um, we do have a, some juvenile fire center that we come across on time to time, and we are working to revamp our juvenile fire center program to provide better assistance to them to break that habit prior to them going to a criminal court. Um, code enforcement, if we find something that is caused due to a fire code violation, we provide that information to our inspectors so they can better educate our, um, uh, our businesses. Uh, unsafe products. Uh, last year, we found um, a light ballast that was uh, an unsafe uh, product. So we reported that to the Consumer Product Safety Commission to see about a potential recall. And then, of course, any criminal trends, then um, we turn that over to APD and work closely with their investigators. Um, if you will, go to the next slide, please. So in 2019, uh, the Asheville Fire Department received a FEMA Fire Prevention and Safety Grant and devoted to updating our fire investigation equipment. So as, the, as such, we provided each investigator uh, personal protective equipment, respiratory protection to prevent our, or reduce our uh, cancer risks for our investigators, new tools, new fire scene excavation equipment, new lighting, new uh, documentation equipment, and uh, a new Matterport camera that we're really excited about. Um, if you would go to the next slide, please. So what the, the Matterport camera is a 3D imaging camera and allows investigators to do a virtual walkthrough of a fire scene after the fact. This allows us to work closely with our suppression personnel for their after action reviews, uh, be able to explain to insurance investigators what we found, and if we were to ever go to court, we would be able to take that to court with us. Um, uh, there's a link down there, uh, the HTTPS uh, my, 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 excuse me, mymatterport.com. Uh, if you would click on that, please, it should bring you up to, um, should bring up uh, one of our, uh, one of our fires that we investigated that shows that. It yeah. may not work with us. It's working. I just have to stop sharing the screen okay. and share no another problem. one. Give me one second. So what this camera allows us to do, like I said, is a virtual walkthrough. So we can actually manipulate this, uh, this this view to be able to walk through this entire fire scene together. Um, each time, so yeah, you can, uh, as you can see, you can uh, view what's uh, what's around you, 3D. Um, but anywhere on the uh, floor level where there's that white circle, um, if you can see one of those, cl probably close to one of those heaters by that door, we'll actually be able to move move the camera closer and be able to walk through that entire fire scene. So this is unfortunately due to that CSI effect that we see from TV. This is the type of thing that juries and um, attorneys and other places are expecting uh, us to be able to provide. So now that we have this tool, this is we are being able to, to offer this. Um, like I said, this is just a, a great tool. Uh, we were really excited to, to show this off 
and to let you know that this is something that we were provided through a FEMA grant. So uh, feel free to, if you have access to that, um, that link after this presentation, feel free to, to take a look at it and, and walk through that fire scene. So uh, that's, I believe, what we have for, uh, for our presentation. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Yes, ma'am, uh, Kim. Well, first I'll start with um, a thanks to Kelly and Bill and your team um, for presenting this information. And uh, I wanted to start with um, what does breaking a habit of juvenile fire setting look like? So um, that would be involving uh, seeing if there's an issue at home that uh, Department of Health and Ser uh, Human Services or DSS, uh, Department of Social Services, may uh, need to get involved with. Um, a lot of times juvenile fire setters have uh, a troubled past or trouble at home and it'd be getting um, mental health um, mental health professionals involved, uh, social services involved, school systems involved, trying to find out what those issues are and prevent that habit. It also um, will get uh, the fire department involved as an education program to let them understand the risks and consequences of juvenile fire setting. So with the restructuring, is it in, like, can you help me make the link between what those changes are hoping to maybe have an end result in ultimately less fires? Like, help me thread that needle. Yeah, sure, no problem. So, um, for an example, we had a fire a couple of weeks ago at Asheville High School. It was um, uh, a juvenile that set a toilet paper or a paper towel dispenser on fire inside the bathroom. So, uh, right now, that's that juvenile does have a potential of being charged with uh, a felony of burning certain school buildings. So our goal would be to work with the, uh, the district attorney's office to, instead of pursuing criminal charges, which would uh, follow them for their, their adulthood, would be to get them into an education program and get uh, health and human services involved to prevent those fires from happening again. I really appreciate that. So what I saw a lot of today um, gives me a, a great sense of hope and appreciation. So what I heard was there's a serious effort to look at the cause and origin. Those were the words that were used um, to review trends um, with the purpose of seeking better outcomes. And I really appreciate that. Um, so I think the part for me that's still missing is I saw the trend data from 2021. So now the public has two. But I'm hoping we can come back and see a maybe longer term, like here's what changed and here's the outcomes, because it's going to take more time to get different outcomes, um, but maybe not just 2021. Like we might need to see some information over that period of time from 2016. Fair enough. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Okay, next on, we have an update from the police department on staffing and recruitment efforts. Okay, thank you, Jenna. I uh, was asked today to uh, update public safety on our current levels of staffing and also on our uh, recruitment efforts. Next, please. The key takeaways from this presentation, since May of 2020, APD has lost 97 officers. Uh, this number represents 526 years of experience lost. Currently, APD is budgeted for 238 sworn positions. Right now, we're staffed with 179, which leaves 59 vacancies, which leaves us down 25%. Uh, of our sworn strength. Although we have 179 sworn officers, 27 are currently in training. That's either field officer training uh, or field training officers or uh, basic law enforcement training. And they are not available for solo patrol at that time, which leaves us down 36% uh, of our sworn strength on a daily basis. When you take into account other types of leave, military, FMLA, off sick, injured, administrative leave, et cetera. 
Uh, we have 133 officers available for duty on a daily basis, which leaves us down 44% of our sworn strength on a daily basis. This is the highest level uh, we have been at since uh, May of 2020, down 44% on a daily basis. Next, please. What this chart shows is kind of the trends we, that we've seen over uh, since 2016 regarding attrition, what we know, how many officers we normally use lose per year. And you can see the tremendous spike in 2020 and 2021. Uh, despite the fact that we were able to hire 25 officers in 2021, you can see that we lost 39. So our uh, rate of attrition is, is higher than our ability to find replacements. Next, please. This just kind of shows uh, going back to May of 2020, just the losses that we incurred uh, month to month uh, to the present day. And really what we're just trying to say here is, you know, you, you, you can see uh, already we've lost four officers in uh, January of 2022. So, um, the losses are continuing. We're, we're not uh, seeing really much of an abatement in, in officers not leaving. It, it, it continues at a steady rate. Next, please. This is our staffing by division. Uh, you can see that our patrol operations were 64% below. Criminal investigations down by 58%. Community engagement down 50%. Uh, our management team, you know, just running the daily day operations and professional standards and property rooms and things like that, we're fully staffed and we need to be fully staffed. Uh, but you can see significantly down in both patrol and criminal investigations and community engagement is, is where we're uh, have, have the highest percentage of vacancies. And then, of course, down at the bottom, you can see we have 27 have officers in training at this time. Next, please. As far as recruitment goes, uh, police recruitment, <clears throat> excuse me, is difficult in Asheville. It's different, difficult across North Carolina and in agencies across the country, and the 18,000 agencies across the country. So everyone uh, is having a difficult time in law enforcement, not only retaining, but in uh, obtaining replacements. We do have replacements coming over the timeline to get them to solo patrol on the road and to get them on the street is significant. The city has entered in a $225,000 contract with Epic, a full service police recruiting service to assist us with the filling of vacancies. And these are just, next please. Jenna, there, uh, yeah, these are just some headlines we clipped uh, from all over the country, from Philadelphia, some of the biggest cities in America, New, New England states, everybody's struggling right now. It's, it's not just us. Of course, we have been hit particularly hard percentage-wise. Uh, we have seen some of the biggest losses than any other agency in the country, but it is a national issue. Next, please. So the good news is replacements are coming. Uh, we have nine recruits currently in field training. They will be available for solo patrol in May by May of 2022. We have 14 recruits currently in basic law enforcement training. They'll be available to us in November of 22. We have 10 possible recruits scheduled for the, our July uh, 22 BLET class. They will not be available until April of 2023. So it really takes about 14 months. By the time someone comes in, shows an interest, in working for APD and they fill out their application, it takes about 14 months to actually get them to the street. Uh, we had hoped, we were working with uh, AV Tech to hope uh, to potentially run a class in March, um, but that just fell through because we could not get uh, the, the potential recruits, we could not get him, them here fast enough. Uh, for a March class. So the, the class size was just not big enough for them to run a full uh, training academy. So again, the, the, the timeline to get them here uh, is considerable. It's 14 months. Next, please. As I said, uh, council approved 
uh, in December of 21, a contract with Epic Recruiting. This will greatly enable APD in the city of Asheville to be shown on a national level as a great place to serve and work. What we'll be looking to do is showcase the professionalism of being a law enforcement officer for one of Western North Carolina's outstanding places to call home. So we're really going to feature the quality of life that we have to offer here, the mountains, the people, the culture, and of course, safety, all for a connected for a great quality of life. Our contract with Epic Recruiting is for two years and our team is aggressively working on moving forward. Epic will be here uh, beginning in March to, to start their work with us. Uh, a question uh, that I've been asked is what our strategy would be and how Epic works towards a diversified workforce in the recruitment of minority applicants. So who we've invited here today from Epic is Janae Toon and she can kind of um, outline that strategy for us. So Janae, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And then do you guys have the, these slides in this presentation that we can flip to so that everyone can follow yes. along? Yes, uh, Jenna, next. Okay, so before I start um, and move into the slides, I'll introduce myself. Like the chief said, my name is Janae Toon. I am the Digital Marketing Director with Epic Recruiting. I also sit on the Oro Valley Police Department's Chief Chiefs Advisory Board, um, where I help out with recruitment and um, specifically recruiting in diversity and inclusion. Um, and so the way that we do this, there's kind of a multi-pronged approach. Um, Jenna, if you want to hit the next slide. The way that we do this is obviously the two key things that need to happen um, is that trust needs to be built within police agencies and the surrounding community or you know city that they support, as well as the story being told. Um, I can definitely echo what the chief is saying about this being a national problem. We are busy beyond belief. In fact, uh, yesterday and today, I was actually presenting um, at the ninth Annual Police Recruitment and Retention Summit in Philadelphia. And there were over 100 departments just at this one event that they put on. They put on multiple throughout the year, all with the same exact story, all with, you know, um, very high attrition rates. And so um, we've recognized, obviously, that there's a problem. Um, and so the way that we battle this is through a two-pronged part, at least in the digital marketing um, regard. We do this in social media content and we do this in paid advertisement. And so some of the, the ways that we do that, some of the approaches that we have are to, um, one, to use counter stereotype imagery on websites, social ads, to kind of rec rectify the misconceptions. So if you think about it, obviously we all know that there is a narrative that surrounds law enforcement right now. Um, and it's not always for each department. This is not always based on the department's true heart or their conduct or um, their desire as an agency. And so a lot right now, a lot of people, when they think about police officers, the idea that they have in their head is them kicking down doors and, you know, holding people on the ground. And, and so what we do is we, you know, we show police officers in, in our high content or high engaging content, um, we utilize imagery that is counter stereotypical. So we've got, you know, as you see, even in this photo, um, women in law enforcement, um, people of different ethnic backgrounds in law enforcement, because I think there are a lot of people that believe that that doesn't exist or rarely exists, um, or that they can't survive in that because they've got to choose a side in some way or another, um, them smiling so that, you know, we remember that police are kind and that they serve the public. Um, so we're very intentional about the content that we put out, um, because that helps to tell the story of Asheville Police Department so that the the view someone has when they think about a career in law, law enforcement isn't one put there by people who don't know Asheville Police Department or, you know, officers or the chief. Um, the next thing is, um, this is kind of a best practice that we put into play that we also hope that the department echoes as well, and that's celebrating holidays of underrepresented cultures within social media posts. Um, the biggest thing for recruiting diverse demographics is to allow them to feel like they can see themselves in that position to truly be able to relate and feel seen. And so celebrating ho holidays that aren't the major holidays of Christmas, but, you know, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, Juneteenth, um, you know, allows people to see that Asheville not only knows that these things exist, but supports these cultures as well as welcomes them into their agency culture. 
Um, one or two social posts per month are dedicated to highlighting women and people of color. These are not stock images. These, this is, um, you know, people from the agency. Um, and again, this kind of speaks to telling Asheville's story. And so, you know, in the last 50 to 100 years, police really have not had to worry about telling their stories. People grew up, wanted to be police. And we know that during recent events, this has kind of shifted and they're having a hard time recruiting and retaining. And so um, this just basically allows us to, to get in front of things and, and tell Asheville Police Department's story. Um, and so it, you know, highlights some of the women that be, may be there, people of color, um, people of different sexual orientations, just to be able to highlight that Asheville Police Department um, is a place where where different de demographics can, um, you know, become a part of the team as well as thrive and succeed. Um, we also run multiple ad campaigns, which contain copy, meaning just wording, and graphics that promote promote both gender and ethnic diversity. So we'll have, you know, probably ten to twelve campaigns that are running, all of them with a specific goal in mind. Excuse me, obtaining more women, obtaining you know more ethnic diversity, whatever it is that Asheville is looking for, and I know that they've um, presented a desire to do so to expand and to recruit a more um, diverse field of um, you know applicants and lateral transfers, um, and then we also utilize specially targeted audience features for inclusive and expansive reach of those diverse individuals. The great thing about social media and being in 2022 is that. Platforms like Instagram, Facebook, um, they really allow us, and, and Google Ads as well, they really allow us to target certain audiences. So if I'm creating, you know, an ad campaign to speak to and um, appeal to an African-American audience or um, the female audience, I can really target that specific audience within a specific region so not only does it get to the right person or your ideal candidate, but then also we can watch on the back end and see how those um, perform. And all of those things are just kind of standards of how we operate and, and the, the um, tangible things that we do within digital marketing to ensure that we're recruiting and making Asheville Police Department feel like it's a place that you know anyone can be and feel comfortable and feel supported. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is now considerations and best practices that we recommend to Asheville um, and carry out with them through digital marketing and, and the rest of our recruiting services um, to make sure that Asheville Police Department truly is a place where anyone can come and be accepted and supported. And so obviously the first step to fixing a problem is to admit that there is a problem. And so there's no real way to successfully recruit people in a diverse population um, without acknowledging and repairing that relationship between the two. Um, and so building trust is, is a, there's going to have to be an intentionality. And so we obviously help out with that as well and hope that, that the department echoes these same things. And so, like I said, we, we hope to and plan to reverse that occurrence specifically within Asheville and the community that it serves with the digital marketing strategies that I talked about in the first slide. Um, it's also done with the department by conducting open dialogue and kind of assessing, taking inward looks at, at the department, the culture, the policies, um, from which I've you know heard just in this, this committee meeting, it seems as though the entire city of Asheville really um, has a um, commitment to assessing if policies are um, you know, beneficial. So, and we do that as well. So on the social media posts, it allows obviously for, for possible recruits or possible new hires or just people in the public on the recruitment specific social media that we'll build. Um, it'll allow them to engage and us to engage positively as well, which also will speak to telling the story, correcting any misconceptions about, um, Asheville. And then on the next slide, you'll see that the next consideration of best practices. Oh, can we go back one? Oh, there's, there's one missing. So I'm going to, I'll just tell you this one. Um, so that is to start young, um, reaching young people of different genders and backgrounds and ethnicities. Um, it's really important to, to start trying to reach, whether that's through advertising, social media, community programs, um, 
reaching them while they're still forming their identities and worldviews, because this allows them to be open to law enforcement and the positive truth. Like I said, nothing about what I do is about manipulation or mistruth. Um, all of it is just highlighting positive truths about um, Asheville law enforcement. And, um, you know, our team has the unique ability to do that because not only do we understand and uh, appreciate and are considerate of um, and passionate about law enforcement, but we are just as passionate about, you know, gender diversity and ethnic diversity. Um, and so it puts our team and even more specifically me in this really unique position to be able to make police departments successful in that regard because we stand for both of them with equal passion. Um, so some of those that we, that we um, kind of suggest to departments are to obviously implore the digital marketing strategies um, and also doing that for any community program. If there's any community programs like an explorers program or cadet program um, or a mentorship program, your school resource officers, um, those are the kind of things that we take. And then we use those same digital mar marketing strategies to push those out to the community. Um, and also, you know, to address those current issues and, um, you know, fix those misrepresentations as curriculum and any of that. If you guys have citizens academies or, like I said, explorer cadets, really being able to start young and addressing that um, because looking the other way obviously isn't a way to tell someone, hey, we see you and we want you here. Um, so the next slide. Um, this is just to be overt. And like I said, with all of these steps, these are things that Epic Recruiting will be doing on behalf of Asheville Police Department and also suggesting that they echo within the agency themselves, but really just being intentional. Um, and this is in office and online. And so you just want to be able to show your heart. You know, we know that police officers have amazing hearts and that there is massive sacrifice. And, and we also know on the other side that there are, you know, are cultures that feel unseen or that there is um, strain on that relationship between them and law enforcement. And so um, we really just want people who are looking to be able to not only feel like they can see themselves in the position, but to see that they can, all of them is supported in the position. So because obviously if you look at someone like myself, if I was to be a recruit for Asheville Police Department, I am going to be in law enforcement and I am also going to be um, an African-American woman. And so I need to feel like both of those parts of me are supported and can succeed there and that I don't have to choose, you know, where I'm at. And so being overt with your message, I know the, the heart of the chief and the command staff is really to have diversity, really to show that they are community oriented and that they want the city to thrive. And so our job is to just be very overt and pushing that via content, via you know, wording, advertising, recruitment, specific social media, um, and just ensure, be, ensuring that the community around them knows that this is their heart rather than allowing, you know, maybe a national stage or a personal experience that they've had in the past to write that narrative, we get out. And so really, Asheville Police Department is already Asheville Police Department, and they are already great people. Our job is to just tell that story to everyone else. Um, and so that's kind of the way that Epic Recruiting works. There's obviously some, um, you know, web design and things of that nature as well. But as far as the digital marketing um, aspect, those are kind of the ways that we plan on getting in front of that. And to speak to that, like I said, we've got hundreds of departments across the um, region that you guys are in, as well as thousands across the nation that are having these same problems. Aurora, Colorado, Berkeley was having very severe issues. You know, everyone is really in that place. Um, and these are clients of ours that we've not only employed these practices, but watched them be able to succeed specifically in, in the, the city I live in, in Arizona, um, you know, I've done these same things and pushed this same thing within our department, and we've seen um, large increases in female officers and officers of different sexual orientations as well as ethnic backgrounds. And so these things truly work. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to do that with Asheville and to be able to create and help them create a department where their department reflects their community, because I think we all know that if a department reflects what the community makeup is, they are better at policing that community. And so that's just, that's our job here at Epic and my team's 
job and me specific sp- specifically to run that um, is to help Asheville successfully do so. Thank you, Janae. Any questions from the committee of Janae? Sandra? I think you may be muted. Thank you very much, Janae, for putting on this presentation. Um, I, I saw it in advance, but I did, really didn't expect it to be um, such a, um, a, a program that could actually change uh, a complexion of issues that we're facing now. And I see that from the things that you've done here, I can actually see that the positive outcome would be amazing for any community. Because like you said, sort of telling the story about the positive in it, that image and uh, the nar- positive narrative of the police department prior, and, and then taking that into uh, consideration of improving, you know, people in the community wanting to improve the policing uh, how, as before, and now to reflect the community that we live in. And um, I basically, what I want to say here is this, I know you were, are you basically sort of gearing toward hiring um, and recruiting local officers here with your campaign? Is that more or less, is where it's been most successful to um, any local uh, candidates for the police department? So we, it kind of depends on the, the department. Um, you know, we've had people who only, who have such a big area around them that they only, or their state or county policy says that they can only hire from those right around them. Ithaca, Ithaca New York is one of those that says they have to be within that county or a, a, a surrounding county. Um, but we have others like in California that target places around them in Seattle and Oregon and Arizona, some that like Temple, Texas, that look nationally. Um, because obviously the wider the net, the bigger chance you have of pulling people who are quality candidates um, while also still being targeted in in the type of people that you're speaking to. So that'll all depend on what the goals. As we launch everything, we'll speak with um, actual police department, their command staff, and everybody that's working with EPIC, and we'll kind of pin down exactly what their goals are, what their their ideal candidate is and where they want to be able to look, how big they want those boundaries to be. And then, then from there, I'll just do, you know, whatever it is that they're looking for. Okay. But, but this is what I want to find out. Have you uh, discovered uh, in this process that a lot of times by hiring local, do you think sometimes it may be more successful because people are familiar with the people in the community? Yeah. Yeah, so they it definitely is. I think obviously, um, and it's successful. It's I think looked at as a success on both sides because not only do you, are you hiring for the community, are they hiring? It's looking like you know the way that you vote in, you know, a council member or anybody else. You've got someone in that can speak on your behalf that understands what you're going through. And so I think for the community, they love to see someone local. Um, whether that's within the city or just, you know, slightly around it, be able to come in and be a part of that change and that, um, you know, that recruitment. Um, And also for the department, it's great because you've got people who already have a heart for the people that you're serving. And so there's definitely a success. You do, um, you know, want to be open to other areas, but I, I would say the biggest win that you can have is seeing people locally come into the police force because not only are they successful because of the reasons I just said, but then you also think every new person that's local in Asheville that becomes a part of the police department now becomes an ambassador for the things that I'm talking about, the positive narrative. And so you really then have walking billboards within your city compounding on these digital marketing efforts, compounding on the police, their recruiting efforts. And so I definitely see you know, to be the biggest win, to be able to find people who are local. Kim? So um, I want to start with that council has been looking at the racial disparities at who's vulnerable in our community to domestic violence. So are we recruiting with the intent to address the root causes of domestic violence? And if so, what does that look like? 
So I think that would probably be more of um, a question for the department, just because obviously, like I was saying um, with Sandra, that we kind of take their, when we do the launch, we kind of take their goals and, and things like that is what we're looking for because what we want to do isn't just check off diversity boxes, right? Like the, the reasons they're bringing us in is to truly be able to make a positive um, difference in the department. And so those kind of statistics or, you know, more complex issues or just very real struggles that the community is going through is the way that we want to be able to form our entire marketing strategy around. And so I, I think I would probably kick that question over to the chief just because I haven't been brought in the loop on, on those statistics or that issue to be able to speak to it as well. Um, but I can tell you that from an Epic recruiting side, that anything that you guys have in Asheville that seems to be um, kind of a consistent issue or a devastating issue like domestic violence statistics, um, we take all of those into play when we have kind of this day long discovery day and brainstorming time with the department to ensure that we are not only solving the department's problems, but but working to solve the community's problems as well so that they truly are safer with Asheville Police Department around. Uh, okay, I mean, I, I Councilmember Brody, can you kind of re repeat what what that question was? Because I had a little difficulty understanding what you were exactly looking for. So to rephrase it, now that the question is moved, are we asking to address the racial disparities in our folks who are vulnerable to domestic violence? It, it maybe need to be restructured as like, is what we're asking for with intent? Or do we have a plan to address the disparities in enforcement and the root causes of crime? I mean, the root causes of crime are quite diverse and, and, and what, what causes crime, what causes victimization. What we're looking for in our recruitment effort is to bring in police officers who have a level of maturity, or have a level of intelligence, and have a level of empathy that will assist them in, a, in addressing and dealing with victims of crime in general. So that's the type of uh, officer that we're looking for. We're looking for that, you know, that dedication to service and the commitment. And uh, again, also just the maturity and the empathy to deal with these complex issues. You know, hopefully during our recruiting process, you know, we can identify individuals who carry those traits, but but it's a bit of an imperfect science there, but certainly that's the can type of candidate we're looking to bring in, if that answers the question. So what I hear is that the root causes are diverse. And in previous meetings, I've heard that poverty is among those root causes and that we're looking to recruit police. That's the purpose of this. And I agree that is the purpose of this. When I see on this last slide that the APD sworn staff is down by 44% on a daily basis. Can we go back to slide, I think it's 11 or 12 about the ad. Okay, thank you. So this is for the public that are listening to this as part of the public record. We're 44% down in staff. The needs of our community health and well-being can't wait. The city of Asheville has service expectations and obligations that aren't being met. And with the vacancies that we see, the council has, the way I see it, two options on the extreme. One is that we stubbornly insist and not adapt to the situation at hand, or we provide new instructions for the city manager and take this opportunity to meaningfully, meaningfully respond. So we need apples. We're asking to recruit oranges. We pay for messaging, we got it, we contracted for storytelling, but I'm hearing from so many people of Asheville that it doesn't line up with the story of Asheville in part because it doesn't acknowledge the history of how we got here. So it doesn't match our story. So once again, I'm concerned we're hoarding resources for policing when we knowingly can't fill the vacancies instead of taking the opportunity to diversify our public safety response. This is why I will repeat my recommendation for the council this year, asking to freeze 15 of these positions in order to join the pilot community paramedicine efforts to address opioids, overdose crisis, 
over, overlapping safety issues, mental health crisis, youth mentorship program, violence interrupters, quite literally any other thing that people in the community are doing right now to address the root causes, because right now we're just responding and we're not really able to respond. And so I understand that so many people are frustrated with us in the situation right now. And it's because we've not just, we're not able to respond. And I'm not sure that this is the appropriate instruction to give our staff with what we have at hand, because it's not addressing the root causes. So I know these are some of the same concerns. I share some of these concerns and I feel like we're putting our current and future staff in an untenable situation and a fiscally irresponsible one at that. Chief, I have a question um, about us starting to um, give tasks to EPIC on exactly what we're looking for with our new recruitment efforts. I know that there is a high demand from specific areas in our city for police coverage, um, specifically housing, um, the pub public housing. They've been having questions about coverage as well as the um, the number of um, officers to really dedicate their time and their resource to building um, building relationships and trust so that we gain a strategy that can be very specific to those areas. We also see a high demand with um, our cen central business district. They have a different set of needs, um, but the same police coverage, building trust with um, individuals who frequent our downtown area. Both of those can be recruitment efforts, but each demand is very customized to that area. Is there an interest in, in the spirit of diversity, is there an interest in doing a special police recruitment er effort where we recruit for areas like our public housing, where it's designated to um, a certain culture, a certain way of living, and the, ch the challenges that are um, that frequent just those areas. Or in the same spirit of special police officers, those who are designated to our downtown area, they respond to the men mental health responses, crisis interventions, they're building relationships with our homeless provider service network, and our business owners, they're designated and stationed to just that area with just that task. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I, I think Janae did mention this. I mean, our ultimate goal would be to recruit hometown talent. That's that's what we're looking for most of all. And I, and I think with their target approach, we can reach communities that we haven't traditionally been able to, to reach. So that's when when epic comes here in march as we map out our strategy and our plan that will be a big part uh to to maybe get into areas not maybe but definitely get into areas that we've had a hard time uh penetrating so that's going to be the work of epic when you talk about you know then once we got we have these recruits we have these officers how specifically they're deployed we're already doing that uh, our officers in housing, our officers who uh, are working in our community engagement division, our officers who are SROs. These are officers who are square pegs and square holes. We know that the role that we're putting them into, and, and, it, and it's not for everyone. Everyone can't be an effective F SRO. Everyone can't be an effective uh, community uh, engagement officer to, to the level that we may need them. Some just human nature, um, some people aren't as, as well at communicating as are others. So what we do when we make these assignments and we put these officers into these specialized units and divisions, we are looking for, you know, not only their, their level of skill, their knowledge of the law, but also do they have the right personality? Everyone can't interview a, a victim of sexual assault. It's a, it's a special person that has the capability to do that. So, and you're right, you, you have to have a different mindset if you're working in public housing as opposed to working perhaps downtown. So yeah, we try to fit the square pegs and the square holes by identifying the characteristics that we're looking for to address the population that we serve. But of course, right now, as you know, um, being down 44% of staff on a daily basis, 
we're, we're plugging holes with the bodies that we have. And we think those officers are doing a very good job, but as we uh, expand the size of our workforce, train them up and identify uh, the, the characteristics of leadership and, and service that those particular units require, we're gonna put them in those slots. Yeah, and I hear that. And, and to me, that is the a linear approach. Um, what I'm saying is to reverse that effort. Instead of casting a big, big net and then ciphering through that for deployment to these specific areas, what I'm saying is um, recruit for those specific areas that type of skill set, that type of interest in providing safety and protection for our homeless community, or, or on the other end, providing safety and protection for the elderly, the women, and the children of certain um, geographical areas. Go out that way. Go Start with the end in mind. Go to those individual recruits with that special interest, and then we we kind of reverse engineer it to see if they have the character, the skills, and the bandwidth to to do the job. Janae, would you um, like to tune in? Yeah. So just going back to that, really kind of talking, speaking to yourself, and then um, Kim as well, and what she said, um, you know, about the the issues bringing police officers in who are then going to be facing the exact same thing that you're facing at this point, because if things are not changed, obviously it's just going to be a bigger population of law enforcement officers facing the same thing or leaving all over again. Um, and so that speaking um, to your suggestion about the reverse engineering, um, I know at least from Epic side, that is something that's, that is kind of the way that we like to um, launch the diversified ad campaigns that I was speaking to. And so that definitely can be, if that was something that Asheville Police Department wanted to do, that is something that we have the capacity to do to say, you know, really gear a recruitment ad campaign um, that is multi-level on social media, on Google ads, on the, you know, paid search results when they type in keywords that really just point to instead of, hey, join Asheville PD, you can be a police officer. Um, that say, you know, that are speaking to and describing the type of work that they do, like let's say within public housing, I think we all know that there's obviously um, a specific, very specific and unique culture um, and need for policing in that area. But then like the chief was saying, um, you know, we're also all aware that they're, they're in order for someone to have a true impact there to not only be comfortable enough to police without policing in fear, to be able to reach and relate to the demographic that fills those areas, um, or even let's say like the homeless in the downtown region, those take a specific type of person. And so putting out um, very specified calls to people who can see themselves in that position based on their character, allowing them to come to the door, us bringing them to the door, and then Asheville Police Department from there being able to cipher out whether or not they truly are. Because like you said, um, from what it sounds like, they've already got officers in those positions. So they they kind of know the lay of the land of what those communities or parts of the communities need. Um, but just from an epic standpoint, I can tell you that should that be something that you guys want to do or um, would maybe address issues more head on rather than in a general approach. That's definitely something that we can do so that you are pulling specific people out rather than getting, you know, let's say on average, we bring about three to 500 um, interested applicants to a department within the first month of the, the launch campaign. And so rather than maybe saying bringing 500 people and hoping that someone in there is good at, you know, could be good in one of those specialized positions, we can put specific campaigns out you know, in addition to the general campaigns, but specialized campaigns as well, so that we make sure that within that number, there's actually someone that you're looking for to address those issues and hopefully make the community feel safer, not just parts of the community, but every culture, every dynamic, every area within Asheville. Yes, and that's exactly what I was aiming for because, and not even, not to seclude this conversation to public housing in the downtown district. It can also cover, um, um, domestic violence and crimes against youth, you know, just being very specific at the targets we want to reach and let that be our direction rather than, like I said before, casting a big, big net and then trying to cipher through and make connections. 
But I also want to specify that I'm also using language around special police officers because a lot of people don't want to do the broader work. They have a skill set, they have passion, they have backgrounds and expertise in a certain area. So while it might be stigmatized to be an officer right now, for them to be in that line of work and also protect and serve would probably help us kind of reimagine. This is Kim. I'll just go ahead and add that part of Asheville's story, we already have a story of having a um, law enforcement officer approach three youth with a semi-automatic assault rifle. And I take personal issue with us recruiting with advertisement of um, military gear and semi-automatic assault, assault rifles. I don't think it's going to help us meet our end goals. Um, it's just, it, it's insulting to me. Um, and to so no, many neighbors are watching it. I'm just trying to make sure you're not responding to, to my statement when I said crimes against youth. Um, right. The general. Correct. Okay. I'm, right. Hearing your concerns, sharing your concerns. I also just have a whole scene about slide 11. So it, this is more like a cautionary tale of like, what is the story of Asheville? And who do we ask to help with that narrative? If this is the narrative, we are in trouble. Yeah, and, I, and 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 to um, to to just not justify anything that we've seen or heard because I hear you and I know where you're coming from exactly, but I think we're caught on this slide. Another thing that Miss um, Toon mentioned was substantiating every um, advertisement by doing the work, by talking about the challenges, by talking just talking about some of the root causes and where some of these crises or conflicts between community and law, law enforcement law enforcement intersect. Because she said that, to me, it sounded like there was a designated effort to have these conversations, not alongside, but before these ads come out. So that ads won't just be for show, but it'll be a manifestation of conversations and strategies that have been, you know, um, evolved from good conversation, Janae. Yeah, and also touching on that, I want you guys to know, you know, like, so we don't, there's not like six images that we recreate with departments. Um, so anytime Epic comes out to do a shoot, we're talking about thousands of photos and we're talking about um, multiple videos, but these are, these are based on um, their stories. So like the, the department shown on this slide is just an example of someone's ad. Now this is a town that is surrounded by um, it's a heavy demographic, a large majority, like 70% of their population is military veterans and people looking to still kind of walk from where they were to where, you know, they're going to be when they come out of the military. Asheville story is obviously something different, or at least sounds like from what you're saying has gone on is something different. And so um, just like in Aurora, Colorado or other places where that may be the case, this would not be something that would be posted. Um, you know, obviously, Again, um, th there's a there's a part in the launch of the campaign where we come together because right now we're in the the kind of pre-launch phases where we tell you what it is that we do. Period. From a very ten thousand foot standpoint, when Epic comes out in March, there is like a one to three day period, like full long twelve to fourteen hour days, where we're sitting around the table with command staff telling us, you know, basically. Who are you? What's your story been? Who are your hearts? But also what's been going on in the community? What are people's concerns? What are the obstacles that stops people from either respecting the police, having a positive relationship with the police, um, trusting the police? And so we can take those things and, and that's the um, intentional, um, you know, the intentional content creation that comes in that. So I don't want you to look at, you know, a specific image put together by our art director put on here so that they can kind of, you know, it's two officers smiling and think that it's a one size fits all. It is the complete opposite. This is very tailored to rebuilding trust in your community. And so if that is rooted in things like the episode that you were just talking about, um, we create these ad campaigns with a massive amount of um, sensitivity. Um, I think, you know, without stating the obvious, I am a young black woman. And so I am probably the last person who is going to head a department 
that creates and pushes anything that is going to trigger um, you know, emotional distress in the population that we're sending it to, that is going to falsify the story of a police department, that is going to um, you know, create a circumstance where we are um, not seeing or acknowledging um, concerns of the community. And so um, that is something that is addressed. And so what you're seeing, I don't want you to just take the image and assume that we copy and paste. So given Asheville's, the little bit of Asheville's story that I hear, I, I would agree with you and say that that would not be something that we would be putting um, you know, in any military, it's snipers, the SWAT, you know, we, a lot of people want to highlight their SWAT teams and tactical missions. Um, these things would probably be not included as much and really trying to bring to the light, um, you know, community programs, community relationships. And obviously the best way for us to do our job is for them, the department to echo the same thing in tangible ways themselves. I hear all of these things. And then can we go to the final slide that shows the 44% vacancy? Because this is something I was worried about in the last um, budget cycle. If 30% wasn't too much for us to diversify our public safety response, is 40% too much? Is 50% too much? We are going to have to do something different. Any more questions from the committee or from um, our guest? Okay. Well, if there's um, there's no action required with with that, that was just a um, a discussion. So we'll we'll move on to our last item. It is a follow up to concerns brought up at the January 11th City Council meeting regarding engagement with campers and demonstrators. Okay. Uh, hey, thanks for your help tonight, Janae. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Okay, uh, for this portion of the presentation, I'm going to turn this over to Deputy Chief. Uh, Mike Yelton. Good morning, everyone. Next slide, please. On January 11th, we received some public comment. Uh, some of the callers alleged that APD on the December uh, protest arrest in Aston Park specifically targeted homeless. Uh, the term raided a camp was used several times uh, and how we arrested the homeless. Uh, furthermore, there were allegations that APD illegally targeted journal journalists during, it, during these arrests. Um, and finally, they alleged that APD participated in, quote, human rights abuses and that we dragged people out of their homes and beds. Next slide, please. Going back to April of 2021, um, we had a series of illegal campers occupy Aston Park. During the solution process to that, those campers were given a seven day notice of a requirement to vacate the city park by city staff. Um, prior to the end of that seven day period, most of the actual campers left, uh, but they were replaced by activists and demonstrators who erected additional, additional tents and expanded the footprint of the original encampment. Um, when city staff arrived to clean up the illegal campsites, uh, the activists and demonstrators delayed and impeded the efforts to do so uh, to the point that they actually assaulted parks and recreation staff uh, as well as APD officers. Um, some of our officers were tackled, struck. Uh, one had a body-worn camera removed from his equipment forcefully, and that resulted in several arrests. Next slide, please. Going into December of 21, um, early in the month, local activists and demonstrators began planning a series of protest activities to be carried out on the Aston Park property. Those planners orchestrated the procurement, the transport, and the placement of large quantities of debris and refuse in Aston Park, uh, specifically in an effort to disrupt City of Asheville activities and place the cleanup burden on city staff. On December 25th uh, at 10 p.m. at park closing, APD officers directed those involved parties to leave the park um, in compliance with the park rules that were clearly posted and the requirements of North Carolina trespass laws. Next slide, please. Ultimately, we arrested six individuals who refused to leave that park. Um, 
two did advise they were members of the press. Of those six arrested, none of them were homeless. Uh, those individuals that were arrested repeatedly refused to leave the park. Our officers engaged in repeated extended conversations with them leading up to that point, uh, offered them multiple opportunities to leave the park uh, and exhibit compliance. Um, and at that point, once the laws are broken willingly and knowingly, one ceases to be an independent observer. Uh, if you're a journalist and you're, you're there as an independent observer, uh, but you willingly break laws, now you become a participant. You become a, a participant in illegal activity. Next slide, please. Our goal is to protect all those involved, to include the campers, uh, the broader community, and city staff. Everything we did that night, uh, and both of those instances in December were warranted, legal, and within policy. We gave advance notice to campers, and the city provided service information. Uh, there were no incidents of excessive force or injury during the incidents. Thank you. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Before I ask my question, council has been presented with multiple opportunities to diversify our response. One was to two folks experiencing homelessness. One is emergency shelter. Um, one is instructions about how our staff should respond to folks who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And I, my concern comes from a place, if the end in mind is that we keep having neighbors experiencing unsheltered homelessness, neighbors who care who are trying to help partner with solutions and putting our staff in this terrible situation, it won't be a surprise we're gonna keep ending up in the same place because it's not gonna meet our goals that housing be rare, brief, and non-recurring. But my questions are, when does a person stop being a journalist? And what is the city's liability if we put our staff in a situation of arresting journalists? Is that a question for me, Councilwoman? Uh, to anyone who's able to answer it, I mostly am concerned that around our policy and whether or not it's the city manager's intention. It doesn't line up with what I've heard stated as our goals, it, but it is where we keep landing. So when do, when is the policy that we stop, a person stops being a journalist and starts being not a journalist? So as your, as your city manager, I, I cannot make a, a determination about um, that particular question in terms of the transition from being a journalist to being a participant, because I'm not a law enforcement officer. Um, I have all faith and confidence that that police officer is doing their job in making uh, a distinction. And I'm hoping being uh, as fair and objective uh, in terms of implementation of that policy or that law or ordinance uh, once they um, intervene and address the, the issue. Um, I, I, I also, now that I kind of have the, the floor, I just want to say some of the comments about um, systemic um, issues related to the cause of crime and so forth um, that were identified in the other conversation. Apologize, I didn't interject then. But we have been talking about public safety as though, again, it is a single department's responsibility to address and solve crime. And um, in 2020, uh, we said, we're gonna reimagine. We are going to look at public safety in a holistic manner. We are not just going to look at the police department as having the sole responsibility for addressing one of the most complex social issues and dynamics that our community faces. And so, um, to suggest that, you know, it is the responsibility of the Asheville Police Department only to address crime, I think is, is unfair and uh, it's unrealistic, quite frankly, because they don't have the resources. Uh, and um, what we are hearing is that we need 
additional police coverage, but we need police officers that are trained, that have cultural sensitivity, that um, will address issues uh, that are, um, I guess, possibly unique to that particular population or the geographical area that they are canvassing and addressing and do it in a humane and sensitive manner. What we saw in Aston Park is something that I don't think this community uh, wants to replicate. And no, it isn't the city manager's desire to have any altercation between campers, between staff, between the people who uh, are not being able to have access to that space when we have campers in an Aston Park or a Pritchett Park or other parks. Our goal is to house people, not to have them live in tents. Uh, yes, we need the entire community, again, to help us address this issue. Um, I will stop there and turn it over to uh, Deputy Chief Yelton to respond to um, the line between um, when a person stops becoming a journalist and becomes a participant. Brad, did you want to jump in? You're muted, Brad. Yes, thank you, Chief, for that. I, I might be able to provide some context from a legal perspective. Uh, there are certainly certain protections that are afforded any citizen and are and those that are particular to journalists. Uh, the First Amendment is something that is guaranteed, and that would include the ability of journalists to uh, take pictures, film, as well as observe any sort of a protest or other activity that's occurring on public property. Uh, however, those are limited to a certain degree. Uh, for instance, uh, the city is allowed to set closing times for parks. Uh, journalists uh, or anyone uh, filming or taking pictures of a protest during opening hours uh, must be protected, uh, and the rights to do that are protected under the Constitution. However, the city, as I mentioned, is allowed to set those closing times. So remaining thereafter, even as a journalist, would not somehow allow you to rise above the legal limitations and those restrictions that are set as reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions on First Amendment rights. Journalists also are covered under the Privacy Protection Act of 1980. This is a federal law that protects the um, content of, of either filming or photographs that they make. But in any case, it is important to say that they are not immune from having to follow um, reasonable police instructions in the event of a protest or to abide by other laws such, I believe in this case, we're referring to uh, laws regarding trespass. So I hope that provides some additional uh, context from a legal standpoint. Were there any additional questions regarding that manner that haven't been clarified by what Mr. Branham said? It doesn't look like it. Um, thank you all for your presentation. Unless you all have more, we'll move on to um, public comment. All right, Jenna, um, are there any callers in the speaker queue? Uh, yes, we have several. I'll let you know when we get to the last one. Caller ending in seven seven six two nine. Your line is open. Hi there. Um, Asheville police are leaving in droves. Maybe it is because they do not want to fight other working class people in our streets. We continue to say we are reimagining public safety, and yet we continue to recruit militarized police with the power to arrest. But people in our community clearly don't want to do this work. Like the recruiting company said, this is happening all over our country. It's not Asheville. If you stood for diversity with equal passion, we, would we wouldn't continue to disproportionately target communities of color in our policing. 
Police were created to capture enslaved people, and they continue to target communities of color and poor folks to protect property over people and are not addressing the root causes of so-called crime. You're continuing something you know isn't working, and at this point, you can't even convince people to want to do this work. Yet we're spending another $225,000. Is the plan to Photoshop a semi-automatic weapon into Martin Luther King's hands and place it on your social media posts and pretend it's diversity? While he was arrested 29 times for standing up for the power to the power of the police state and for fighting for the rights of the oppressed. As for these food in the parks ordinance, um, it needs to be taken off the table immediately. At this point, it's become abundantly clear that police change the rules as they go to get the outcomes they're looking for. Sometimes they even change their policy while they're on the job by lying and later updating their policies to reflect their lies. So I think you all made a big mistake with this ordinance because any veil that the community continued to have that the intentions of these police rules were to create safety have disappeared. Asheville Police Department, backed by council, is systematically trying to make the conditions of our unhoused neighbors so inhumane, so inhospitable, that they will either die, be arrested, or go elsewhere when there is nowhere else to go. Um, I continue to support sanctuary camping now with supportive strategies in place and with the goal of this being as short term as possible um, on the path to housing. We need to put supportive strategies in place to support victims of domestic violence and protect the families in our community right now that are struggling greatly through this pandemic as our wealth gap widens and makes access to basic needs even more difficult. We need to start allocating the money of the 44% of our police department that is missing to fund our community immediately. You can't even fill these roles if you wanted to. The city manager says it's unfair and unrealistic to expect police officers to handle safety all on their own, and yet our budget continues to reflect that as the goal. It feels absurd to continue to hear that we are building trust when we are kicking down the doors of trust and holding folks down on the ground, making any steps to come up illegal along the way. And when journalists want to report on that, we make that illegal and arrest them too. Who would do this job? Especially folks who live in our community and care deeply about it. When is it time that we come back to the table and talk about what true public safety looks like? It seems our reimagining, in our reimagining, we are still heavily focused on using armed police with the power to arrest. Or you're at three the minutes. same thing that arrests journalists, blind protesters, and break skulls. It's time we come back to the table and fund our community, our needs. Caller ending in 9557, your line is open. Hi, my name is Marisha McMorrin and I'm the Executive Director of Food Connection. Our mission is to ease hunger and reduce waste by redistributing surplus prepared food to serve our neighbors in need. Since our inception in 2015, we have connected 385,000 meals to those experiencing food insecurity. Food Connection works closely with partner agencies and community leaders to identify and eliminate barriers to nutritious prepared food. The COVID-19 pandemic showed us the great need for distributing individually portioned meals directly into neighborhoods to serve those who might not have access to other sources of prepared food. While we recognize the challenges that the City of Asheville and the Asheville Police Department face in maintaining public safety, we believe that any ordinance that would prevent access to food and other critical resources or impose unnecessary barriers to those resources would only result in increased desperation for our city residents already struggling to meet their basic needs and could potentially have an opposite than intended effect in regards to public safety. In addition to that point, after listening to and understanding the level of staffing shortages at the Asheville Police Department, I believe that considering an ordinance that would require policing of public spaces to ensure no one is feeding people would be a gross misuse of already strained police resources. We ask that the Public Safety Commission and City Council take pause to listen to the voices of those that are serving as well as those that are being served so that together we can develop and implement policies that are effective in addressing the public safety concerns. Thank you. Caller ending in 1416, your line is open. My name is Carolyn Hunter. I'm a resident of North Asheville and the board chair for Food Connection. My comments are in reference to the restrictions, uh, the proposed ordinance on the restrictions of sharing food with our unhoused and impoverished residents in public spaces. I am asking the city council to take a cooperative approach to creating a solution for improving public safety of our city. 
that will require participation by the city are nonprofits, public service groups, small business owners, unhoused representatives, and experienced negotiators and counselors familiar with the social issues we are facing. No one group, individual, or organization can solve this on their own. The risks you are taking by unilaterally proposing an ordinance of this consequence to our city will cause more harm than good and create further conflict and distress. I understand the economic impacts and the importance of our downtown to tourism and small businesses, but we cannot ignore that as we equally have, and we cannot ignore that we equally have a responsibility to protect the people who have nowhere else to go and are equally victim to the few who are creating the problems you're trying to address. We all have the same goal in mind. This is not something you or any of us can take on as an individual group. In addition, there will be no quick fixes, but there can be short-term wins and long-term goals that we all sign up for. Nothing this complex is or and emotional is easy. Let us work together and serve as a model for other cities facing the same challenges. Caller ending in 2926, your line is open. Hi, my name is Chloe Moore. I'm a black farm worker and I've been farming for 10 years. Uh, and today I really wanna focus on food justice, the injustice of policing and the possible ordinance to limit food sharing in public parks. So currently I have the privilege of being able to work for two um, black led organizations uh, in Asheville, Southside and Shiloh Community Gardens. Um, and so sharing food is a really important part of my job. It's what it's all about. I grow food and I share it with people. Um, and one example of this that, that I do is um, sharing free produce in Shiloh Park, which is a park, um, parks and rec land across the street from Shiloh Community Garden. Uh, and something that we do there as part of our practice is especially um, during the warm months when there's football practice going on and there are a lot more than 25 people um, in the park, we will take produce over from the community garden and share it freely with people. Um, sometimes we even give out recipes and do things like that and share produce. Um, and so my role in this community should be supported and not criminalized. Uh, it, this, this ordinance and a lot of focus of policing intentionally targets oppressed people, houseless folks, black people, poor people, and targets solidarity between groups of people. Um, I, it's pretty clear <laughs> that removing homeless camps is the wrong thing to do especially during COVID, um, especially during freezing conditions um, when there's nowhere for people to go. And police use the people that they are violently oppressing and violently removing and those supporting houseless people um, as an excuse to say how dangerous police work is and get the city support. But statistically, being a farm worker like me comes with a greater risk of death or bodily injury than being a police officer. Statistically, my job is more dangerous than doing police work. And I need support. Don't criminalize my vocation. Those of us who really believe in food justice are always going to continue sharing food in our communities, no matter what happens. We're not going to stop. So it's council's responsibility to decide whether people like me are going to be jailed for what we do, uh, what we do for our communities, or if we're going to be supported. Caller ending in 3533, your line is open. Hello, this is Keaton Hill. I'm calling from North Asheville. Um, I share the concerns of other callers about the city's transparency and approach um, around this food ordinance. Um, from the city's own internal documents, um, which, what has been drafted so far seems to only increase barriers to food sharing and not to increase safety. As the previous caller said, please do not criminalize the vocation of food sharers. 
Um, I also just have deep concerns about the presentation by EPIC. There are really, really good reasons why there is a national, nationwide attrition from the policing industry, and it's more fun, fundamental than just marketing or messaging. Um, I'm a parent of school-aged children, and I was quite alarmed to hear that there would be a strategy of EPIC consultancy to, quote, recruit children, quote, starting young. How will the consent of families be obtained if you are going into our community programs, our mentoring programs, and trying to recruit children into the policing industry? This is deeply disturbing to me. It sounds like a very dangerous approach, and um, this does not build trust with me um, around policing at all or around what it means for us to work together. Um, I do not want tax funds and resources hoarded to recruit our children into policing. Please use the funds of the empty police position to actually meet the mental health and basic needs of our children now, not to recruit them into the police industry later. Thank you. Caller ending in 0780, your line is open. Hi there, um, my name is Jennifer from South Asheville. Um, I firstly want to mention that what you already know is that an 11 a.m. meeting is deeply inaccessible to our community, especially those who are working class and poor who are impacted most by supposed public safety. I wanna speak on a few aspects of this meeting. Um, honestly, my favorite part of this meeting was to hear uh, of the continued and steady decline of officers on the streets and the continued barriers to get more officers on the streets. I'm glad that this community, this makes our community 44% safer from a violent police force. The presentation by Epic was honestly disturbing. Um, why are we wasting money on these marketing tactics to increase supposed DEI in our police force? How is marketing gonna address root causes of crime? The narrative of police is so truthfully bad that we have to hire someone to manipulate the story. There's a narrative for a reason. We need to tell the whole story. Additionally, how violent is it to target recruitment to marginalized people into a job based on violence and the erasure of those exact demographics? How ironic is it to post holidays like Juneteenth when police literally started as slave patrol and that continues today? The city is hoarding funding and economic opportunities for police. Debra, as you mentioned, um, we shouldn't be putting the full responsibility on the police force, but can, that continues to be the pri pri priority of where our funding is going. Like Kim said, why are we not then shifting that money to funding social services that support the root causes of crime? Um, to speak on the, the restrictions on food sharing, um, it's, this is clearly retaliatory and an attack on mutual aid and community care. When the city continues to abandon our houseless with only lift service solutions, that's when the community has to take it into our own hands to support the people they were actively violently abandoning. Caller ending in 1607, your line is open. Good afternoon, this is Victoria Hyatt and I live and work in downtown Asheville. I'm calling in today to voice my support for the APD and my frustration to the city council in general and this group in particular for not supporting the police chief and other leaders and our officers mostly. Ms. Roney, you do not speak for the majority of the city and you are so out of touch with the issues that business owners and residents of this city have, the homeless issue has reached fever pitch and you still want to defund the police. I want you to hear me right now. We, the business community and taxpayers want the police. We are proud of the Asheville Police Department. I think you should be removed from this committee as you will never work with police, listen to police or let police be police. In addition, you're offended by a picture of an officer holding a part of his uniform in a recruitment ad. I'm offended that you don't realize the amount of guns and drugs officers in Asheville have taken off the street. With gun violence rising in our area, officers need guns to protect themselves and law-abiding citizens like me. And you will stop at nothing to vilify these officers every opportunity you have. 
I implore the mayor and the city council to remove you from this committee immediately. Caller ending in 2872, your line is open. Hello, my name is Alex Cobb. I'm running for city council here in Asheville. Um, what, I'm in, what I'm seeing is outrage by citizens before any proposals have been made. The Asheville Free, Free Press reported that members of council reportedly told people that the city may be requiring a permit for feeding the homeless. Why would this happen? I believe this was not even discussed in this meeting. Nobody is wanting to take away the ability to feed our, our unhoused neighbors. People are simply wanting public spaces to be kept clean and usable by all people. This should be a shared value. It's important for our environment to be kept clean. It is important to keep taxpayer funded parks and spaces clean and usable. When talking to a variety of people that work with our homeless population, these people are being victimized and abused by criminals. It is not our goal to address safety. Is it not our goal to address the safety of our homeless population? We do have programs to make real changes in our homeless people's lives. Um, just some crime stats for you. Um, property crime per um, 1,000 residents. Asheville is three times the national median. Crimes per square mile. Asheville is five times the national median. Violent crime per 1,000 is eight times, or is, is double the national median. We are currently down 44% of our police force. How much experience are we losing? We are steadily losing officers. How much taxpayer are we losing when we train and lose um, these officers? Experienced cops are less likely to make mistakes, nor street and crime hotspots in the area. We are spending $225,000 on recruiting plus the cost of training. The silence from our city leaders is deafening um, for the support of Asheville Police Department. If we're going to retain our officers, we have to show the community that we stand with our officers, not against them. There's always room for improvement and more training, but we do have a very great police department. I have been talking to many people of all backgrounds, and they are very, very unhappy with the crime and feelings of unsafety. As a gay man, I'm very concerned that um, about this. You have the duty to the best of your ability to keep us all safe, and I want the police. We must understand that there are criminals that will victimize any and all of us. When, my final question is, when are we going to quit allowing city council social experiment of criminality and policing? It's failing. Caller ending in 2227. Your line is open. Good afternoon. My name is Jay Hill. I'm a resident of North Asheville. Uh, I'm calling today to express my concern and frankly alarm at the recruitment focus and presentation that we saw today with respect to the Asheville Police Department. We've heard a lot about attrition and about what it takes to bring new recruits onto the streets, but I haven't heard much about looking inwardly at the culture of the Asheville Police Department and the culture of policing more broadly to understand the causes of that attrition and the ways to retain remaining sworn officers and recruits. Instead, I've heard, not today, but in the past, that media narratives and agitators in the community are to blame. Some of the goals stated today of the department and the recruiting effort through EPIC is to diversify the recruitment pool and to reestablish broken trust between law enforcement and communities of color. The strategies the city is pursuing to accomplish this include media campaigns with counter stereotype imagery, celebrating holidays of underrepresented cultures and open dialogues. I don't believe that trust between the public and law enforcement was fractured by social media mismanagement or misplaced holiday greetings, so I don't think they are sensible solutions to repairing it. The idea that marketing with images full of in full military gear and enormous high power rifles does little to build trust. The smiles, genders, and skin in those images don't break stereotypes, they reinforce them when they are dressed in that way holding those weapons. I appreciate that Ms. Toon addressed this concern that the city can focus on different aspects of policing, but still those are the images that EPIC selected and presented today. Similar images are featured on their website. None of this seems to have slowed down the process of engaging this firm to attract officers to and within our community. By all appearances, this focus on delivering force and violence from a diverse workforce has raised no eyebrows except from one council member today, and I appreciate her raising that concern. 
the defensive posture of the department and city attorney Branham today with respect to the Aston Park camp further erodes public trust in law enforcement. Officers and the department exercise enforcement discretion every hour of every day. The fact that you are legally able to arrest observers for not leaving the park doesn't make arrests a necessary or morally justifiable move. The same will be true if you provide a legal justification for arresting people for sharing food. I implore, I implore the Public Safety Committee and City Council to break this cycle and work toward more imaginative solutions to actually protecting and serving, actually protecting and serving my family, my children, and my neighbors throughout the city. Thank you. Caller ending in 4350, your line is open. Good afternoon, city council members and members of the Asheville community. This is Reverend Amy Cantrell from Asheville. I too want to join the many people that have raised their voices in chorus to say that we continue to need to look at root cause solutions to the struggles in our community. I connect deeply with parents like Keaton Hill who raise deep concerns about children being involved in recruitment around policing and also the, the deep concerns of pictures of officers with militarized gear, guns, um, and smiles on their faces. This is not the kind of thing that builds trust in our community. I also want to echo others like Food Connection and many, many faith communities around our city who are deeply concerned about the proposal around regulating or curtailing the sharing of food and resources in our community parks. Um, for decades and decades and decades, my life has been shaped around this kind of sharing of resources and food. It's something I have taught my children and something that I learned as a child, um, the deep value of sharing and loving our neighbors. This is a very ancient tradition, the tradition that is connected deeply with our cultures and our ways of life. These are things that don't need to be regulated. We need to continue to say we can't regulate compassion, especially during a worldwide de deadly pandemic when so many people in our community are suffering. Let us move forward with continued focus and energy on solutions and not adding and, and taking energy toward regulation, permitting, enforcement that only distracts us from the real issues at hand. Let us move forward with the solutions that we know we're on the table that repair harm like reparations and solutions that our neighbors so desperately need access to food, health care, mental health care, access to deeply affordable homes with equity and access to emergency shelter. Thank you so much. Caller ending in 4487. Your line is open. Hello. Um, my name is Sharon Foreman. I'm a resident here in Asheville, and I've been listening and watching everything that's going on. And my question is, how do we distinguish between a true journalist and an anarchist? How do we run a city with common sense when we have two council members that are associated with known anarchists? Neither have the intentions of our city's well-being. We do not need cop haters on our council. This city cannot move forward safely with radicals that try to set the city's policy. Thank you. That was our last caller. All right, if there aren't any more comments from the committee. I just would ask for a future agenda item that we um, get a comparison regarding um, the updates to the fire department and how they're addressing the investigation so we can get some side-by-side -side data and see how the new restructuring is working out. And what timeline would you want of that? Because they need some time to just restructure it. Right. I don't think we should wait a year. In the next six months would be great. All right. I take it that staff noted that change. Any more comments from committee, guests, or staff? 
right, this meets adjourned.